Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Oxford Martin School. Welcome to the uh, seventh lecture in our series on inequality. Um, we have two speakers tonight. Um, we're going to hear first from Dr. Marie Paskoff. Um, she is a research fellow at the Institute for New Economic Thinking um, and also lead investigator on the Oxford Martin program on inequality and prosperity, as well as a fellow of Nuffield College. So she specializes in quantitative research focusing on socioeconomic inequality, living standards, intergenerational social mobility, and social policy analysis, um, and was previously in Amsterdam and the University of Tallinn. And we will then hear from Professor Erzabet Bukodi, who is um, a senior research fellow also at the Institute for New Economic Thinking, as well as an associate professor in quantitative social policy. Um, now, just to guarantee that we are bringing a European dimension, as the title promises, um, Erzabet was previously at the University of Bamberg in Germany, at the EUI in Florence, and also at the Department of Social Statistics in Hungary. Um, so what we're going to do is hear um, from the two speakers in that order. And if you have questions, please, we'll, we'll then have a joint question and answer session at the end with both speakers up on, on the platform here. Um, so I'll hand over now to Mari. Good evening to everyone, and uh, thank you very much for these kind uh, words of introduction, and thank you all of you for coming to listen to this talk this evening. Now, um, this presentation today will be about intergenerational social mobility. Intergenerational social mobility is indeed a <coughs> classic topic in the field of social inequality. Intergenerational social mobility refers to the extent to which individuals' life chances depend on family circumstances. We all know uh, that parents matter um, where we end up in life. In this presentation, we are going to study the question whether it differs between countries the extent to which family context matters. Perhaps uh, as a, a point of clarification, uh, even though we are two present presenters today, this is very much one presentation. We are simply dividing it into two. And indeed, I will start with a brief, brief introduction to the topic of social mobility. My aim is to bring some conceptual clarity by talking about different dimensions of social mobility. I will also make an important distinction between absolute and relative mobility rates. I will briefly talk about what we currently know about variation in social mobility across countries and over time. And the most part of this presentation today will be focused on our empirical work. Our empirical work, our research on intergenerational mobility in Europe. And our aim is to provide a country comparative account, a new country comparative account on this question. When it comes to our empirical research, I will first talk about absolute mobility rates. And halfway through the presentation, my colleague, Erzbeth Foucaudi, will take over. She will be talking about relative mobility rates, the patterns in mobility rates, and end with a conclusion. Now, I would like to start this presentation with a definition. Intergenerational social mobility refers to the relationship between the socioeconomic position an individual occupies, and the socioeconomic position in which he or she was brought up. To put it differently, social mobility reflects the extent to which individuals move up or down the social ladder compared to their parents. Now, there is no doubt that in the past decades, the topic of social mobility has occupied academic policy and public debate in the UK and in other countries to a degree not seen in decades. The goal of increasing social mobility has been adopted with vigor, at least conceptually, by both the political left and right. The former Prime Minister of UK, uh, David Cameron, has said that he wants to see a more socially mobile Britain where no matter where you come from, you can get to the top. The fact that social mobility is high on the agenda in this country is reflected by the fact that indeed it's frequently 
addressed in media outlets among policymakers uh, and politicians. As reflected last week, um, the new report that came out from the Social Mobility Commission uh, on social mobility in this country, and it again stirred quite a lot of media attention and discussion. While social mobility might be a topic that is um, much discussed in this country, however, it's also on the agenda in many other countries in Europe. Moreover, social mobility is a topic that is also discussed on, more broadly on the European Union level by, for example, the European Commission in their, as part of their social rights pillar. Uh, the Eurofund is um, aiming to put the topic of social mobility uh, more on the agenda of the European Union. Social mobility is a topic that is increasingly addressed in various um, reports by international organizations as the OECD and the World Bank, suggesting widespread uh, interest in this topic. Now, coming to the question, why is uh, social mobility such a popular topic today, and how does this uh, relate to inequality? A very clear and straightforward point to make is that uh, social immobility in itself could be seen as a form of social inequality. It reflects the fact that children's fates or people's adults' fates are determined by their social origin and their parental background, which they cannot uh, control themselves. However, perhaps um, the reason why this topic has come to the attention even more in the last years has been the idea that uh, social immobility could be seen both as a cause and a consequence of uh, economic inequality. There is an increasing concern among the most prominent people in the world at this day, including President Obama, several Nobel laureates, who are concerned about the fact that the ways our societies are currently built up with the high levels of income inequalities or economic inequalities, uh, this might challenge uh, opportunities for the next generation and we might be um, witnessing reduced social mobility in a uh, generation to come. And this uh, concern, in a way, challenges uh, the neoliberal ideology, you might argue, in a sense that uh, it uh, counters our idea that if you work hard, uh, you can reach success uh, despite your parental background. However, we could also see the direction the other way around, which is another issue that is discussed, and the idea that social immobility could also be a cause of economic inequality in itself. There is um, increasing discussion and uh, an idea in the, in the literature suggesting that the socially immobile societies might be um, not taking full uh, advantage of uh, the human potential. We might be limiting uh, some people uh, in developing their talents and skills and contributing to our societies, which might in turn uh, have adverse consequences for economic growth or progress or innovation, you might argue. Now, while we know that social mobility is a topic that um, has received a lot of attention in the last period, it is worthwhile to mention the fact that it's also a common concept that is rather widely used and people have different things in mind when they talk about social mobility. Hence, my aim here is to bring uh, some conceptual clarity by acknowledging the fact that there are different dimensions of social mobility. As I mentioned earlier, the definition of social mobility is the idea of parents passing on their socioeconomic advantage to their children. However, the socioeconomic position could be defined in various ways. We could be talking about uh, socioeconomic uh, position in terms of uh, education, wealth, income and earnings, social class. This uh, picture here is not exhaustive. We could talk about other dimensions such as <coughs> health, status, perhaps power in some contexts. And indeed, these dimensions matter because we know that uh, different disciplines tend to focus on more on one or the other dimension of social mobility. Economists focus on social mobility within the distribution of incomes and earnings, while so uh, sociologists focus on mobility within the social status hierarchy, or now more often the social class structure. 
Another conceptual point I want to make is this distinction between absolute and relative mobility rates. Indeed, this is a main analytical issue when it comes to social mobility research, and that this distinction has been recognized by sociologists since 1970s and only recently has been taken up by economists. This distinction matters because they are much different concepts. Absolute uh, mobility refers to the proportions of individuals moving from different origin positions to different destination positions. This can be reflected in individuals' personal experience of moving up or down, and on a country level or societal level, we could talk about percentage of people being upwardly or downwardly mobile. However, what is important to realize when it comes to absolute mobility rates is that the differences in origin and destination distributions across generations, which are a result of changing occupational and class structures, play a large role in determining the level and trend of absolute mobility rates. In this sense, absolute mobility is not so much an indicator of equality of opportunity, but is rather a reflection of an opportunity structure determined by the class structure changes in the society. If there is a large expansion of professional class, then an increasing amount of people would be able to experience upward mobility simply because there would be more room at the top. When we come to talking about relative mobility, which is also sometimes referred to as social mobility, then this is uh, what more strictly refers to the idea of degree of equality of opportunity. It is a strength of association between individuals' uh, origin and destination positions considered net of marginal distributions. In fact, when we talk about social mobility, then the, we most often uh, mean relative mobility. It is the relative chance of someone from a lower class moving up as compared to someone from higher class moving up, ignoring what is happening in a societal structure. Since relative rates of social mobility are what most closely tap on the question of equality of opportunity, I will spend the next few slides talking about relative mobility rates. And indeed, there are two main questions that um, are commonly addressed in the literature and that are relevant. The first question is, is there some long-term directional trend in modern societies towards greater or less social mobility? Or could we witness perhaps stability or merely trendless fluctuations? The second qu question is, are there systematic differences across countries in social fluidity rates? Now, coming to the first question, the question of trends over time, we can see here that there are mixed evidence, both within disciplines and within disciplines. Sociologists studying class mobility divide between those finding essential stability or mere fluctuations in relative rates versus those who find increasing social mobility. By contrast, Economists studying income mobility seem to divide, at least in the UK and the US, between those who find stability, no change over time, versus those who find decreasing fluidity. Here a popular paper by Joe Blanden, who found uh, decreasing fluidity and was widely commented on in, in this country. Now, when it comes to cross-national differences, differences between countries, then again, there are some differences between disciplines. When it comes to economists, who uh, it might be worthwhile to mention, have taken up the topic of social mobility somewhat uh, more recently, have um, commonly related, uh, have, have, um, it seems to have an assumption that there is variation between countries in social mobility rates, and this variation is uh, most uh, commonly explained by income inequality. There is a hugely popular hypothesis linking income inequality directly to 
intergenerational social mobility, the Great Catsby Curve idea, and here indeed depicts that the higher income inequality in a country, the higher the correlation between fathers and sons' income. Now, the question of cross-national differences uh, among sociologists, however, who study class mobility, emphasize um, on one hand a common pattern with specific country variation. This perspective is built on the idea that in modern industrial societies with nuclear family systems, we would expect not much differences between countries, or at least not systematic differences be between countries. And this is based on the idea that um, parents will act in a rational way to always pass on their ro uh, relative socioeconomic position, no matter the institutional context and the uh, social policies. This is uh, to contrast uh, another view, uh, a, another camp of sociologists who see systematic variation across countries in social mobility rates. And unlike economists who see this uh, explained by income inequality, in sociology the more common explanations are educational systems and forms of the welfare state. The argument here being that the more egalitarian educational systems or forms of the welfare state, the more social mobility we might expect. Now, coming to this study, I mentioned already that most of this presentation will be based on our empirical work. And uh, the objective of this study is to re-examine country differences in intergenerational class mobility in Europe. For this, we use a newly constructed data set that extends the time horizon from 20th into 21st century. We make a distinction between absolute and relative mobility rates, and important to mention that um, the next presentation, the analysis we present, it will be focused on social mobility on men only. This is based on the idea, and uh, from previous research, we know that uh, social mobility patterns are different when it comes to genders, and uh, the analysis should be done separately. And for purposes of time in this um, presentation, we only look at men. As I mentioned earlier, it is important to make clear the dimensions of social mobility that we are talking about. And um, in this research of ours, we follow the idea of um, social class. We measure social class as an European socioeconomic classification uh, ESEC, you could call it shortly, and uh, it classifies people into seven social uh, class categories. You could have more um, or less, but uh, this is uh, simply to illustrate the class uh, classification that uh, we are most commonly using. It ranges from class one, including large employers, higher managers, professionals, to class seven, including routine workers. And the essence of our analysis is to study the relationship between the social class of parents and the social class that their adult children will end up in. When it comes to social class, an important factor to mention is that it reflects employment relationships. And you'll see in this figure, which might be somewhat difficult to read, that there's an elaborate logic behind constructing social class categories. I'll just briefly mention um, what is the idea behind social classes and, and how we uh, argue that it uh, captures the employment relationships. Indeed, a distinction is made between those people uh, who buy and control the labor of other people. These are the employers. We can talk about those who um, sell their own labor directly to customers and clients, such as the self-employed people. And then we have employees uh, which constitute the largest share of the labor force, and they sell their labor to employers and employing organizations. A further distinction which is crucial to make um, for employees is the type of labor contract that they are uh, engaged with. And uh, at the two extremes, one could make a distinction between basic form of labor contract and the service relationship. When it comes to the basic labor contract, then uh, it is uh, commonly associated with long, uh, weak longer term uh, commitments um, on the behalf of employer, uh, and uh, it's associated with um, more insecure employment and uh, fewer longer term prospects, whereas uh, with service relationships, the assumption is that uh, 
individuals are providing uh, a service, they are in a more diffused uh, relationship with the employer and um, they, next to the fixed wages, they are also uh, often entitled to fringe benefits, uh, salary increases and career opportunities. The crucial point to remember, remember is that social class refer to, refers to employment relationships. Why uh, is social class an important concept and why we think it uh, captures economic circumstances of individuals? This um, is based on uh, empirical evidence which shows that class positions are not only related to current income of individuals, but they capture three other important dimensions of people's material and economic lives. First, uh, income security, the chances of becoming unemployed, being long-term or short-term unemployed are much more likely among lower class individuals than higher class. It also captures short-term income stability and long-term income prospects, which um, is perhaps um, most important. We can compare the economic lives um, of, of someone in a higher class who can expect their incomes to rise until the age of 50 to 60 perhaps uh, to someone in a lower social class whose income uh, progression is likely to stop at the age of uh, 35 already. Therefore, we focus on class because we, can, we see it as an important form of inequality that uh, is most consequential for material well-being and life chances of individuals and we would see class as a better indicator of economic status than current income. Briefly about the data that we are working on, we use the European Social Survey data. We have uh, pooled different waves and we have in total 35 countries. We look at men in the age of 25 to 64. We have some 75,000 men in our sample and we use some additional data to improve on the quality of uh, parental um, information on parental social class. Now, as I mentioned, we make a distinction between absolute and relative mobility rates, and I will start by talking about what we find regarding absolute mobility rates. Absolute mobility rates measured are measured in uh, simple uh, percentage terms. They show the percentage of uh, mobility among the totality of men within each country. In fact, uh, the way it's measured is very simple. We look at uh, simple uh, cross tabulations between the class of origin, which refers to the class of the uh, parent, and the class of destination, which refers to the class of the adult um, ch child. And we can detect uh, those who are not, um, uh, not at all mobile, these are on a diagonal. If you're born in class one, you will stay in class one. These will be considered immobile. However, if you're born in class two, and you, uh, if you're born in class one and you end up in class two or any other class, you will be considered downwardly mobile. And if you're born in class two, you end up in class one, you will be upwardly mobile. And we, uh, some classes in the middle uh, do not uh, have a hierarchical structure and these, uh, the movements within these classes are called um, horizontal mobility, while these people have a different class position than their parent, it is not higher or lower. And this picture depicts variation in um, Europe in total mobility rates. Total mobility rates, as I just explained, are the combination of upward mobility, downward mobility, and horizontal mobility. And this uh, shows the percentage of people who end up in a different class than their parent. And we can see that on average, the red dot there, some 74% um, of people in Europe are in a different social class than their parent. What we can also see from this figure is the fact that the variation between countries is not all that big. It ranges from 65% to 78%. Even though there's a, quite a sm small variation, we might look at the ranking of countries. We can see that uh, countries like France, UK, uh, Luxembourg, uh, Estonia seem to have a slightly higher total mobility rates, while countries such as Greece, Hungary, Lithuania have uh, somewhat lower ones. 
However, the message remains that the variation is not all that big and the uh, ranking of countries does not appear to be all that systematic. The story becomes uh, more interesting though when we decompose the total mobility into upward and downward mobility rates. Here we depict indeed the percentage of people that are downwardly mobile and the percentage of people that are upwardly mobile in a country and there appears to be a negative relationship. We can see on one hand countries such as the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Switzerland and Germany where in some cases almost half of the population has experienced upward mobility whereas less than a third has experienced downward mobility. This is in contrast to countries such as Latvia, Estonia, Russia, Poland, where almost half of the people have experienced upward mo uh, downward mobility and uh, less than a third have experienced upward mobility. Then we have a range of countries in the middle where the upward and, and downward mobility rates are relatively similar, ranging from 30 to 40%. However, as I mentioned earlier, these uh, rates of absolute mobility rate, rates are highly dependent on the marginal distributions and the changes of the marginal distributions between the class of origin and the class of destination. In this uh, figure, we show the ratio of upward and downward mobility rate uh, plotted against the index of net difference in class distributions between sons and parents. What this index of net difference shows is the probability that a randomly selected son will be found in a higher class position than a randomly selected parent. And what this uh, figure tells us is the fact that countries such as the Netherlands and Luxembourg and Switzerland experienced a big expansion in uh, individuals ending up in higher social classes. We can say that in these countries there was a large changing shape or upgrading of social class structure. Indeed, we know that in these countries there was a, a large growth in the salariate uh, distribution and uh, indeed that may, uh, the consequence of this was the fact that there was simply more room at the top for people to be upwardly mobile. The fact that some of the Nordic countries stand out with um, above average uh, downward mobility rates stems from the fact that they had a much earlier expansion in higher social class positions. In Nordic countries, for example, the proportion of individuals originating from higher class parent backgrounds is much higher and the growth in um, higher class categories uh, has not been recently that big, which simply means that they are more at risk of downward mobility and there is less room at the top to be upwardly mobile. However, when we look at the Eastern European countries such as Latvia, Estonia, Russia and Poland, first of all we note the fact that the index of net difference is uh, close to zero in these countries, suggesting that there was very little change in the class structure over this period. And when it comes to the Eastern European countries, we need to consider their um, specific nature and the major regime transformation that occurred with the fall of the Soviet Union. During the transition period, many desirable jobs in these countries disappeared, causing the top classes to shrink while there was a growth in unskilled jobs and uh, in, in production and services. These uh, structural changes are probably what sparked the surge in downward mobility rates in these countries as uh, observed in our data. To conclude, when it comes to absolute mobility rates, we conclude that there is no systematic country variation in total mobility rates. However, countries with a higher upward mobility rates tend to have a lower downward mobility rate. Country differences in upward and downward mobility rates are driven largely by country variation in net differences in the class distributions between the parents' and children's generations. This means that in countries where there was indeed, as I mentioned earlier, substantial uh, expansion of the professional and managerial salariat, the proportion of men originating in these classes is overall 
higher than in countries than, that did not experience a significant expansion of the salariate in the parental generation. And in these countries, indeed, uh, more individuals were at risk of downward mobility and fewer at risk of upward mobility. Now we are turning to our findings when it comes to relative mobility rates, and this is where Professor Erspet Bukodi will take over. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, right, so as, as, as Mary said, um, this is very important to, to make distinction between absolute and relative mobility rates when it comes to intergenerational uh, social mobility, and as, as, as she explained, relative mobility rates simply refers to the strength <coughs> of association between, between the uh, class of origins and class of destination, considered net of differences in the class structure both across, across countries and of course across, um, across um, um, generations. So now the question is how to measure this relative, relative mobility rates. Um, and the way uh, how we measure relative mobility rates, indeed the way as everybody in this field measure relative mobility rate, rates, i.e. we use odds ratios. Um, so let me explain very briefly what odds ratio is. Uh, let's imagine that we have a society with only two social classes, class A and class B. So what we do is we cross-classify um, a parent's uh, social class position with uh, children's social class position, and we have a nice, uh, simple two-by-two two cross-tabulation, as it's shown um, on the slide. And we then calculate a one single odds ratio in order to measure uh, the strength of association between, social, um, between individuals, origin, and destinations. And what this odds ratio tells us is the chance that someone originating in class A being found in class A um, rather than class B uh, relative to the chance of someone else who originating in class B being found in class A rather than class B. And um, if this odds ratio calculated in a way as shown there is equal to one, this means that the chances in that society is, is uh, chances that that societies are equal. Um, in other words, there is no association whatsoever between class of origin and class of destination. If this odds ratio is higher than one, this means that the chances, the mobility chances, are unequal. Um, i.e. an association exists between uh, people, class of origins and class of destination. And the higher the uh, value of this odds ratio, uh, the more unequal the society uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of relative mobility chances. So what we then uh, try to do is we use these odds ratios uh, we try to use um, odds ratios of various kind to investigate country differences, uh, both in the level or the size of relative mobility chances and the pattern of mobility chances. I, first of all, what we are interested in is cross-country uh, differences in Europe in the size of these odds ratios that I explained before. And then we turn to another question, uh, the pattern of odds ratios, i.e. we try to then explain um, the course country differences in the level or the size of the odds ratios. But we have, because we have um, a, a bit more complicated society, not a society with only two classes, as Mary explained, uh, we work with, with the seven um, category cross, uh, cl um, class classification, we need to resort to some kind of modeling, statistical modeling exercise in order to pin down relative mobility rates and country differences in, in them. So what we do here is when it comes to the level or the size of, of, of relative mobility rates, we calculate the so-called global logos ratios and also we use 
um, um, so-called log linear models, which is a standard tool in this field to pin down cross-country differences in relative mobility rates. When it comes to the pattern, i.e. the sort of explanation, the accounting for country differences in the size of, of relative mobility rates, we will calculate um, so-called symmetric odds ratios. Just a very brief, let me now explain um, what these measures Ah, just bear with me. Uh, I think it's important for you to understand the basic um, of, of this exercise. Uh, so regarding the global log odds ratios, uh, if we use a simplified version of the class schema, a five by five mobility table for each country's country, and then what we do, we partition these, um, these uh, mobility table into two by two subtables. Uh, and then, and then for these two by two subtables, we calculate the so-called global um, odds ratio, much in a way as I showed you on the previous uh, slide. So altogether, if you have a five by five um, uh, mobility table, um, we can calculate 16 global log odds ratios uh, because we can partition this five by five table into 16 uh, two by two um, subtables. And then we indeed calculated these global log odds ratios separately for each of our 30 countries uh, in, in, in our data set. And, um, and then um, this, this, this is the first measure that we used uh, to pin down um, uh, strengths, um, the, uh, the cross-country differences uh, in the strengths of um, association, association between class of origin and class of destination. So in order to say anything about, about um, cross-country differences in the, in, the, in the size of these global log odds ratios, you have to conduct um, serious um, uh, statistical tests to pin down um, whether a difference uh, that you see um, uh, between two countries in the size of these global log odds ratios is significant or not, right? It's just possible that if, um, with eyeballing you do see some significant, so you do see some difference between the sizes of these global log odds ratios, but these are just uh, due to sheer chance, they are not significant. So in order to, to, to investigate this question, um, we used a, a, a statistical method um, uh, developed by uh, Sir David Cox um, and um, his course, right? So that was one way, one way to pin down to, to um, um, uh, cross-country differences in, in, in the size of, of, of um, association between class of origin and class of destination. As said, the other way is, is, is resorting to um, two um, widely used log linear models in this field. Um, the first of, of these uh, log linear models called common social um, uh, fluidity uh, model that basically states that there is an association between class of origins and destinations, but that all the odds ratios uh, that express these association are common across countries, right? So basically we can't see any differences in these or the totality of odds ratios across countries. The social fluidity is the same um, regardless of any country difference that they may show up in the class, uh, class structure. So the second model um, second long linear model that is very widely used in this field and indeed we use in our research is called unidif, uni, unidif model um, or uni, uniform difference model. And this model allows us to test the possibility that all the odds ratios uh, that defines the um, origin destination table stronger or weaker in one country than in other country by some common multiplicative factor. Usually this multiplicative factor is called beta. 
So in LA uh, language, this means that the model allows us for the possibility that the relative mobility rates or social fluidity are uniformly more or less unequal in country A than in country B, right? So this is another method uh, that we use uh, in order to say something about country differences in the size of, 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 of the relative, relative mobility rates. Okay, so let's now see some results after this, this um, explanation of the, of, of the modeling exercise. Uh, so what we did, first of all, we calculated these global odds ratios that I explained before for each of our countries. And then, and then we did this significance test pairwise for each of our countries because we wanted to see <coughs> whether the differences um, are uh, in the size of these global log odds ratios significant or not. And in this table, um, if, you, if you see blank dots, that means that the difference in these global logos ratios, i.e. the size of, of the association um, um, uh, between class of origin and class of destination between the two countries involved, not significant. If you see black dots, you see that means that there is significant country difference in the um, association between class of origins and class of destinations. So if you just look at this big table, what strikes you that there are, we have much more blank dots than black dots, right? So this means that what is striking in Europe, according to our finding, is the country similarity rather than the country difference in relative mobility rates. Okay, so for instance, if you if we compare the UK and the Swede in Sweden, you see a black black oh sorry a blank um, dot. This means that the relative mobility rates based on this global logos ratio exercise not don't differ significantly between these two countries, right? But the end of the table, you do see um, uh, some black dots, right? Um, and if you look at which countries these black dots belong to, you see that countries like Hungary, Portugal, Bulgaria, Poland, Spain, Luxembourg, and Germany are among these countries. And you are wondering, okay, these countries differ significantly from the rest, but obviously, the, the, this bunch of countries don't belong, belong to a certain welfare state. It's quite a mixed bag of country, uh, countries, some of them post-communist societies, some of them sort of matured, um, matured democracies or affluent uh, democracies such as Germany or Luxembourg. And we have, we have some uh, southern European countries here. So based on this picture, the uh, two messages that I would like to, you to to, to, to consider is, is the striking feature is the country similarity. And when it comes to country differences, the countries that are more unequal in terms of uh, relative mobility rates than in the rest constitute a rather mixed bag of countries uh, not really belonging to any particular welfare state, for instance. So let's now see another uh, matrix uh, based on the other statistical exercise, the log linear modeling exercise that I explained. So we did exactly the same as before. We did a country pairwise comparison to see um, whether there is any significant difference in the size of the relative mobility rates if we use this log linear uh, modeling exercise that I explained before. So what we see here, um, that visibly we have a bit more, bit higher number of um, black dots, 
right? But still, the defining feature, as it were, of this table is, is the country similarity, because roughly 70% um, um, of these pairwise country comparison uh, led to uh, non-significant uh, results, i.e. there is no significant difference between countries when it comes to relative mobility um, rates in the majority of cases. And when it comes to country differences that are significant, uh, by and large, by and large, the message is the same. The same countries, um, Hungary, Poland, Bulgaria, uh, Spain, Luxembourg, and Germany, um, differ uh, from, uh, from, the other, from the rest of the European countries um, in, in a sense that they have much more, significantly more unequal um, uh, relative mobility rates than in the rest of the countries. So let's now draw um, a kind of map of social fluidity um, of Europe based on the two measures of um, social fluidity that we introduced before, i.e. on the x-axis of this nice diagram, we plotted the unidiff parameters for each of the countries in our data set. The, the zero means the average, the y-axis we plotted uh, the global logos ratio again for each country and zero means the average. And uh, we say that we have basically three groups of countries, right? Um, the countries with red dots are the so-called low fluidity countries. Low fluidity means that the association between class of origin and class of destination is strongest in this a um, bunch of countries such as Hungary, Poland, Bulgaria, um, uh, and, and Germany, for instance. And we have another bunch of countries, uh, high fluidity countries, um, these, these um, green dots uh, denote these countries, and we have the in-between countries uh, with, with black dots. But, but I would like again to highlight uh, that the difference between the group of countries um, denoted by, by the black dots and the group of countries uh, denoted by the green dots are not statistically different, right? The countries that differ from the rest are the countries with the red dots, okay? So these are the countries where the relative mobility rates in Europe are significantly more unequal than in the rest of, 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 of the countries. Right, but then the question, and the question is why, why, how we could account for this difference um, in, in relative mobility rates when it comes to these this, this 10 or so countries that differ from, from the rest of Europe. And um, what we did as a next step, we, we tried to pin down, try to somehow model um, the pattern of, of, of relative mobility rates to shed light um, um, potential uh, causes or potential explanation why these 10 or so countries differ from the rest. So what we did here, we calculated a set of so-called symmetric odds ratios. Okay? So the symmetric odds ratios are the ratios that are shown on this, on this table. And because we have a seven by seven um, a table, Together, in total, we have 21 symmetric odds ratios. So for instance, the one um, here at the very uh, right corner, top right corner of the table, uh, means uh, that someone who is originating from class one, i.e. the top class, um, to what is the chance that this person end up in the top class versus the bottom class uh, relative to somebody else who is originating from the bottom class, uh, what is the chance of this person to end up in, in, the, in the top class versus the bottom class? Okay, so we took then these 21 symmetric odds ratio, again for each 
of these 30 countries in our data set, and we try to characterize these odds ratios in a meaningful way for our purposes. And what we did was um, turn to past research and uh, we, when, when, when we tried to characterize these symmetric odds ratios, and we were inspired um, by a long-standing tradition in class mobility research, which is called the so-called topological model. This is a very long-standing tradition in this area of research. And what this, this, this um, method or tradition tells us is, is that let's try to characterize uh, these 21 symmetric odds ratios in a meaningful way for our purposes. Let's try to indicate whether an odds ratio um, um, involves a class uh, tra transitions between class positions such as inheritance in the top class. Um, i.e. among the higher managers and professionals. So this means locating symmetric odds ratios that imply social immobility at the top of the class structure. The other set of symmetric odds ratio that we are interested in um, um, constitutes those who, th those odds ratios that indicate inheritance in the class of the self-employed, i.e. implying immobility that may occur more directly uh, through intergenerational transmission of businesses or capital. Um, this is, these are the odds ratios on, 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 on that side of, of, the, of the slide. Um, and we also, again, following this, following this topological model tradition, try to identify symmetric odds ratios that indicate different ranges of mobility. Um, so sh short range mobility basically implying transitions between adjacent class position, for instance, between higher and lower managerial class. A middle range, middle range uh, mobility implying mobility between class position at two hierarchical levels apart, uh, for instance, between higher managerials or higher professionals and lower supervisors. Um, finally, long range mobility implying mobility between class positions at least three uh, hierarchical level apart, levels apart, for instance, between higher managers and professionals and between working class. So what we then did, uh, we calculated these symmetric odds ratios and then we characterized these symmetric odds ratios in a way as we show on this slide. Um, distinguishing between these two kinds of so-called inheritance effects and the three kinds of hierarchical of, of uh, effect uh, between short-range mobility, middle-range mobility, and long-range mobility. And then what we show here is, 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 is simply uh, plotting these different kinds of symmetric odds ratios for each of the 30 country to see whether we see any um, cross-country differences in them. So let's just try, so let's start with the, with the short range and the middle range mobility. Um, what we see here is basically there is no country difference whatsoever in that, right? Uh, the dots um, uh, means um, um, the odds, uh, symmetric odds ratios themselves. These um, uh, lines around the dots means the so-called confidence intervals. And if these confidence intervals overlaps with each other, this indicates no statistically significant difference between the countries in question. So the story is that there is no whatsoever country difference in the middle range and the short range mobility. So this can't be an explanation why we have seen that these 10 or so countries differ from each other, from the rest of, of, of the countries in our data set. But, but if you look at the long range uh, mobility, the, the story is somewhat different. Uh, you see visibly different because we do see some country differences here. And again, if we see 
a significant difference between the countries. We, we, used, we used these black dots. So the black dots there means uh, that the country in question differ in this case from the UK. Because in order to, um, to draw any conclusion from these kind of graphs, we had to um, we had to have one of the countries as a reference point, and we took the UK as a reference point. You see a little red dot there um, uh, in case of the UK. So for instance, what we see that in Germany, uh, the long range, the, the symmetric odds ratios um, implying long range mobility are significantly bigger uh, than the symmetric odds ratios uh, implying long-range mobility in UK. Uh, you see Hungary, extremely unequal society in terms of this long-range mobility. Um, uh, or, or Bulgaria or Poland are very unequal society. So these societies with the black dots are basically the same societies uh, that was that we kind of grouped and named as low social fluidity uh, societies. So this already suggests for us that one of the main reasons, perhaps, why these societies differ from the rest of Europe, because there is uh, stronger barriers uh, in the societies for people to experience this long-range mobility. For instance, um, it's much more difficult in Hungary or in Germany uh, for somebody coming from a working class background to end up at the top. Of, of the class hierarchy. So this is what basically this uh, picture tells, uh, tells us. Um, and and coming, to, uh, coming to this so-called so two inheritance effect, um, again, we say uh, what we see that at, the, at the, oops, sorry, at the bottom, uh, at the bottom that there is no country difference in, 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 in uh, symmetric odds ratios implying uh, inheritance in the self-employed class, uh, but we do have a country difference, much on, along the same line um, when it comes to inheritance in, 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 in the, in the, at the top of the class hierarchy among the higher managerials and higher professionals. So in some uh, significant country differences in the pattern of inequality in relative mobility, chances arise only with uh, long-range transition, especially if these transitions involve immobility um, in the top class, i.e. among the higher managers and professionals. And the overall implication then is that the counter differences in the level of social fluidity that showed up on the previous slides are to a large extent driven by counter differences in the opportunities of long-range mobility. For the sake of, for the, sake of uh, the time, I think I will skip this slide because the chair is warning me that we are running out of time. Um, so the final issue that I would like us to revisit is, is, is this Great Gatsby Curve issue. You remember perhaps that um, Murray introduced the Great Gatsby Curve. It is a very popular, um, popular um, phenomenon, as it were, especially among economists. And just to recap, this, this Great Gatsby Curve claims that in countries with higher level or income inequality, we will find lower level um, of relative uh, mobility rates. Um, and what we did here is um, we, next to each other, we have the original Great Gatsby curve, and we have our kind of Great Gatsby curve taking our measure of relative mobility rates into account when, uh, when uh, producing our kind of Great Gatsby curve. Just coming back for a second for the original version of the Great Gatsby curve, uh, this issue got really, really a lot of criticism 
um, not only among sociologists, but also among economists to some extent. And there are three main issues with this original version of the Great Catsby Curve. One of the major issue is that as it stands, it compounds absolute and relative mobility rates with each other. Uh, so this original version of the Great Catsby Curve cannot be taken um, 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 using the intergenerational earnings elasticity, people kind of compound absolute and relative uh, mobility rates. So it's, it's not a pure measure of social mobility. So this is the first criticism that we, um, we must um, uh, consider uh, when it comes to the original version, version of the Great Catsby Curve. Um, and also, uh, more and more people uh, recognized that in case of the number of countries, um, on the on the on the picture, parents' income is not observed but statistically imputed. Uh, so there is some kind of arbitrariness um, introduced here. And also, there people pointed out that might be a problem with the x-axis, i.e., how we measure the Gini coefficients, which of course is the most popular measure of income inequality. Um, what, for instance, what time? Um, what, what age of people's um, life course we measure um, the Gini coefficients. And I can um, list another bunch of problems, potential problems with the Great Catsby Curve. So what we try to do, we try to get rid of these problems. So we believe that we now have a very good measure of social fluidity that is not compounded by absolute mobility rates. As Mari explained, it's, it's very, very important in this area of research to distinguish between absolute and relative mobility rates and, and to have a pure measure, as it were, of the relative mobility rate. So we believe that now we do have a pure measure of these relative mobility rates, either using the global logos ratios method or using this kind of uh, log linear methods that I explained. Um, and, and the other, other, other thing what we did was that we tried to measure the Gini coefficients at the time when people makes important dis uh, decisions about their educational investment and, and that of course is very much consequential for their later labor market chances. So the bottom line is that if you look at, if we look at our version of the Great Gatsby Curve, we scarcely see any Great Gatsby Curve because you see that the line that we draw here is very shallow, right? You see a very shallow line. The country is kind of scattered around fairly randomly uh, around this line. And if we calculate the Pearson correlation coefficients between the Gini coefficients and um, the measure of social fluidity, this is extremely low. This is 0 0.34, um, um, right? So it's not income inequality based on these results that kind of drives um, or explain or account for country differences in intergenerational class mobility at least. Uh, but of course you then question then what if it is not income inequality? And indeed this is the question that we turn um, in the next phase of our research, or put it differently, what we would try to explain is why these 10 or so countries that we identify as a low social fluidity country, why they differ from the rest, right? Or another in interesting question could be, why, we, why do we see such a striking country similarities in relative mobility rates um, in, in, in Europe? So just to wrap up, uh, I promise it will be very, very quick. Uh, so there is no apparent league table of the European nations in terms of relative mobility chances. Uh, the striking feature is the degree of cross-national similarity rather than the cross-national difference. The only countries that have relative rates that significantly different from the rest are ones with more unequal rates, in other words, with a lower level of social fluidity. 
Um, and this bunch of countries quite mixed back. Uh, most southern European countries, societies belong to this group, such as Portugal, Spain, or Italy. Some central European matured democracies belong to this group, such as Germany and some post-socialist countries, but not all of them, um, only three, in, as a matter of fact, Poland, Hungary, and Bulgaria belongs to this uh, mixed bag uh, countries. So what is then suggested is that rather than um, there being any systematic cross-national variation in relative rates of class mobility, these rates will tend to move towards a similar level and pattern in most of all uh, societies with market economies and nuclear families um, with any significant variation resulting from nationally specific factors. And this is much of the results that John Goldthorpe, who is by, and he's sitting there actually, um, found 30 years ago, okay? Uh, and why, this is a little bit, why, why we see still this um, uh, amazing country similarities, this will be the question that we will turn in the next phase of our research. Thank you very much. Okay, so we've got a, a little time for some um, questions. Um, and we're going to, there's a microphone going to wander about. Please, please. Um, this is actually being recorded and, and webcast, so if you are uncomfortable with that, then you might have to hold back from questioning. Um, so, is it, do we have any questions? A show of hands. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. You're comparing um, social class and uh, income uh, fluidity. Um, I, I was very surprised to hear nothing about uh, the inheritance of wealth. Absolutely amazed. It, there's a sort of taboo on the subject of redistributing the inheritance of capital. I, I run a campaign for universal inheritance, and the idea is that you give everyone a chunk of capital when they're 25, uh, financed by abolishing all the um, exemptions for business and, and uh, land, uh, and um, taxing inheritance tax at a progressive rate according to what people receive rather than what they leave. And people receive including uh, um, the, capital, the universal inheritance itself, so it gets clawed back in due course. Something should be done. About one third of all land in this country is still owned by the families who grabbed it at the time of the Norman Conquest. I think that's enough of me, but anyway, thank you. Does it work? Um, yeah, thank you so much for this excellent comment. It's a really relevant point. It comes back to this issue that I mentioned in the beginning. Does this work? It's on, you need to hold it like this up to your mouth. Oh, okay. Um, so it, it comes back to this point I mentioned in the, in the beginning about dimensions of uh, social mobility and there being different ways to pass on your social economic position to your children. We happen to look at a class, uh, economists mostly look at income. Um, one uh, important point to mention is that this kind of research is hugely challenged by the problem of data. It's a unique <coughs> research pro a question in a sense that we need to have not only information about individuals, but we need to know also information about their parents and how would you collect such a data. It's, uh, it, it is not easy at all. And, uh, and in fact, um, why social class analysis is so popular is that it could be considered as one of the most reliable ways to inquire something about, uh, uh, in, at least in a survey, about parental background, because people are much more likely to remember their parents' occupation, what work they did when they were a teenager, rather than to remember what they earned or how much wealth they owned and so forth. So that's, um, that's the reason why wealth mobility, I think, has not in, in enough been studied. However, I think uh, we, in our project, for instance, uh, aim to move to this direction very much, and, uh, and there is emerging data allowing to do that. Um, so uh, I think in the next few years, we will see that more often. 
just, just uh, on this. Uh, so to some extent, to some extent, actually, we, we speak to this issue um, in terms of, as, as, as I said, in terms of um, direct um, um, transmission of, of capital and businesses in case of the self-employed people, right? So even this class schema that we are working with, um, we are able to, able to say something about um, um, direct transmission of capital and businesses. And I very much agree with Murray that, and, and with you that wealth is a very important part of this story. Uh, and very much due to, to lack of proper data, we just can't go into this at the moment, into this in, in a detailed way as we, as we wish to do. But again, um, we could resort to some previous research actually that showed some um, non-negligible association between people's class position and their sort of pos vast position. So I believe that at least to some extent, uh, using social class, we could speak to this uh, inheritance of, okay. of wealth. But I very much agree with you that we do need to do much more on this side. Thank you. Are there any other questions? We have one here. Thank you. <coughs> Daniel Scharf. I might have got the wrong end of lots of sticks here, but this is a snapshot 2015, 2016. And with this data, can you now analyze all countries, or particularly this country, to see how different generations suffer from inequalities? So I'm, I regard myself as a floater. Nobody born in my position could have ended up in a less uh, or in a higher position than I reached with no effort at all. And it would be very interesting to see in your 25, 25 to 64, 70,000 people, mm -hmm. men, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, whether somebody now born in my position actually doesn't, has to work very hard to move up or doesn't move up at all, mm -hmm. as well as intergenerational rather than mm -hmm. uh, cross countries. Right, uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, so indeed today what we try to, to give you is a kind of snapshot picture on cross-country differences rather than um, over time change within countries. And indeed that is a very important issue and our data would allow us to, to do something about it at least for some of our countries, not all of these countries, uh, chiefly due to the small end problem. Right? So these data, um, uh, these data refer to basically the, the first decades of this century, uh, between 2002 and 2010, okay? Uh, but because we have data for a number of generations, um, for different ages, we indeed um, able, to, able to, to speak to this over time change. Um, um, and that will be an issue that we would, 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 would take up. And of course, uh, regarding only this country, Britain, I myself, together with, with Professor Goldthorpe, performed um, a number of this kind of analysis showing what's happening in this country in terms of overtime change. And what we found is, is, is perhaps a boring sto story of stability, not much. Relative, uh, uh, yeah, in terms of the relative rates, um, uh, at least. But, but the story might be in dif uh, indeed uh, different when it comes to absolute mobility rates, because what your research also shows is the fact that in the middle of the last century, um, there was a high upward mobility rate in this country. It's the era of a golden era of um, social mobility that some uh, call, and this is why many people from this generation might feel like they experienced um, uh, high mobility because they went up rather quickly compared to their parents, and this is indeed uh, not the case anymore. Okay, are there any other questions? Yes, yeah, so, uh, I wondered if you could comment on the um, the popularity of the Great Gatsby curve thesis. I mean, it's fairly widespread. Um, <coughs> it has a lot of adherence in, you know, to the Brookings Institute, to various other public policy um, uh, 
groups have, uh, have lent him quite a lot of credence. Well, the popularity perhaps comes from, from, the, from, from, uh, from being at the right place at the right time. I mean, uh, it was, um, uh, I don't know how it exactly ended, in, ended up in the hands of, uh, of the economic advisor of Barack Obama. And, uh, and um, it also came out at a time when uh, research on increasing inequalities was emerging and becoming very popular. Um, so um, in a back backdrop of realization that uh, our countries are becoming more economically equal, unequal and there is a huge variation between countries and on top of that, uh, the, the scatter plot uh, that was presented, which is um, and um, statistically seen not very reliable, but it, um, it caught the attention of many people. And as I mentioned earlier as well, it, it challenged this uh, idea, neoliberal ideology idea that uh, perhaps uh, the way our societies are currently developing are, are not anymore providing these uh, opportunities to, um, uh, to people that if you work hard, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll get there as well. So I think it, it was sort of a moral challenge, which uh, many people liked. Yeah, I mean, I think it, uh, the, great, the appeals of Great Gatsby Curve is in its simplicity, right? It, it's very intuitive that the higher the inequality, income inequality in country, it becomes more and more difficult for people coming from low background, either income background or wealth or social class background to end up at the top. Uh, but then when you do, really rigorous statistical analysis and you try to measure properly uh, these relative mobility rates, indeed it's not there. It's very intriguing why it's not there uh, and what else then. Um, and actually we have some preliminary results that what we did, and, and we didn't show it today, what we did was we replaced the income Gini coefficients with the education inequality. So that you can calculate um, much in a similar way Gini coefficients for education inequality. And then we did see a much, much stronger association between um, educational inequality or educational Gini and um, relative mobility chances, which kind of suggests that what might be really important is, is, is education and, and, and inequality in education in the parental generation as well. So not only income that matter, not only sort of economic kind of resources in the parental family that may matter, but social cultural resources could be perhaps even more important, and I indeed am doing another kind of research about education inequalities in this country, in Britain, and what we tend to find is that over time, what became, became more important is actually not the economic type of resources of parental family in order to advance their children's educational career, but more of the social cultural uh, type of resources of parental families. So we have to take into account, we have to have a much more comprehensive view, as it were, of, of, of parental resources of various kinds, rather than just uh, focusing on income. Um, okay, we're, we're going to take one more question. So let, let You mentioned the golden era of um, social mobility a couple of minutes ago. Um, is that in the UK? And what period was that? You know, you have done research on this. Right. Okay. So the golden era of social mobility was it's a bit basically the golden era of the welfare state. It's the 50s and the 60s. Uh, when it got a bit of a pear shape, it's already in the 70s, and of course the 80s uh, when such a Mrs. Such a came, and it it became really. Good. Um, th thank you. Um, we're going to have to close there. Um, but before we thank our speakers one last time, I just there are three events I want to draw your attention to. Th I said this was the seventh of our series on inequality. Uh, next week um, it closes, not with a lecture, but with a panel event. Um, it's, um, we have a panel of five, Professor Goldthorpe, whose name decorated the final bullet of tonight's lecture. Um, Brian Nolan, who's also in the front row there, who opened this series and has um, 
help put it together. Uh, Stefan Durkin from Blavatnik, and also um, he's also at DFID. Sandy Fredman, who's uh, co among other things co-director of the Oxford Martin Program on Human Rights for Future Generations, and Simonetta Manfredi, who's the uh, director of the Center for Diversity Policy Research and Practice. So a diverse panel, um, t trying to bring together a lot of the themes that we've looked at in, in the first seven events um, of this series. Now, on Tuesday, before that, um, this coming Tuesday, we have um, the new director of the Oxford Martin School, Achim Steiner, who's just arrived here in September from the um, United Nations Environment Program. He headed that for 10 years, and he's going to talk to us um, about the very challenges of a global transition towards a green economy under the title Towards a Green Economy, Pathways Through Politics, Culture and Economics. Um, so that'll be in this room, uh, five o'clock on Tuesday. And then just one for your diary, um, the 23rd of January, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, New, York column, New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman is coming back. He gave us a, um, a very interesting lecture in the Sheldonian, I don't know, a year, 18 months ago. And he's coming back to talk about his new book, which is called Thank You for Being Late, which is not a guide to etiquette of the evening, an optimist guide to thriving in the age of acceleration. And he'll talk about how the planet's three largest forces, climate change, advance of technology, um, and globalization are driving each other and driving um, change in the world. So that's just one for the diary. It'll be in the Sheldonian on the 23rd of January. So let's thank our speakers and thank you for coming.